Welcome back. So last time we talked about mitigating specific attack types, so make sure you watch that episode as well. Now in this episode we're going to continue this discussion and if you remember from last time we also covered a specific type of uh, vulnerability called a buffer overflow. Now there are simpler types of buffer overflows and one of them is integer overflow. Now integer overflow is a very very simple concept much simpler than a stack overflow, but also that much easier to perform accidentally in your code. And the main idea here is that everything that you store in a computer's memory has to be stored in a limited and pre-allocated space in that memory. Now that space, of course, since it's finite, it's limited, can only hold so much data. Which means that if we think about storing a number in memory, just a simple number, well, that number is going to have a possible minimum value, which is probably going to be close to zero or to some negative value, and a possible maximum value, uh, which can be really high or not, depending on how much memory we've allocated, but it's definitely going to be the maximum value that we'll be able to store in that allocated space. Now, failing to manage and to think about beforehand what's going to happen if somebody enters the maximum allowed value in a specific field, like the number of items in a shopping cart or the, uh, the age right, in a, in a registration form. What happens if somebody stores the absolute maximum value that we can store in there? And also, what happens if somebody tries to increment, add just one to that maximum value? What's going to happen then? Well, to understand this better, let's head over to the drawing board. So to keep things simple, let's think about the smallest amount of memory that we can allocate. And that's going to be one byte, which means eight bits. And let's pretend that we want to store a number in these eight bits. So in order to store a number in here, every bit position within this byte is going to have a value of either one or zero. Those are the possible bit values. Nothing new so far, I hope. Any combination of ones and zeros is a valid combination and every combination is going to give us a different number. Now the bit positions are numbered starting from the right to the left. So we're going to start with position number zero on the right and position number seven on the left for a total of eight bits. Now for a quick conversion to base 10 decimal, we just need to raise two to the power of the corresponding position. So we're going to have a two to the power of zero, two to the power of one, power of two, and so on and so forth. So the decimal equivalent is going to be made up of powers of 2, starting with 128 on the leftmost position, 64, 32, and so on and so on, divided by 2 until you reach the last position, which is 2 to the power of 0, which equals 1. So now I can calculate a couple of things. For example, what is the specific value of this binary representation here on the screen? Well, what I need to do is to add all these numbers and then multiply them by their corresponding digit in the binary number. So 128 multiplied by 1 remains 128. Same with 64. 32 multiplied by 0 is eliminated. 16 remains, 8 remains, 4 eliminated, 2 eliminated, and we end up here with a grand total of 270. That's decimal number 270. So this right here is the binary representation of the decimal number 270. Now, there are a couple more things here that we can deduce. For example, what is the minimum value that we can represent in this 8-bit integer? All right, so let's make a copy of the original number and let's change all these numbers to zero. So what's the decimal equivalent of this one? Well, simple enough, we're going to eliminate all these factors here that we don't need to add anymore. And the end result is going to be zero in decimal. Now, what's the maximum value? We're going to do exactly the same thing, but this time we're going to set all these bits to 1. So what's this maximum value in decimal? Well, we just add all these decimal equivalents here, and we're going to end up with 255. So that's the maximum value that we can represent using just one byte of data. So basically our byte right here can store any value between 0 and 255. That's the minimum and that's the maximum. Now the problem here is, what happens if starting from this already maximum value at the bottom, somebody comes one day and accidentally or intentionally tries to add an additional number to it. Tries to do a simple addition here, take this maximum number here and add it with one. What's the end result of this? Well, obviously we don't have enough bits to represent this value because theoretically at least the resulting value would be something like this. So we would end up here with a nine bit number which we don't have enough memory to store. 
So what happens is that this extra bit here that gets generated is going to be eliminated, ignored, and the actual end result is going to be a big and round zero, which probably is not what you would expect if you did not program this specifically, but it's what's going to happen if your number is unsigned. That is, it doesn't store any kind of information regarding its sign. That is, is it a positive or a negative number? We don't have anything about that. We can only store positive numbers the way we did it so far on this slide. Now, if we're storing signed numbers, then the highest bit, the one on the position number seven, which is also called the most significant bit, has a special meaning. And this bit right here is no longer used for the number, the actual integer representation, but instead it defines what is the mathematical sign of the stored number. And the convention is that a number of one equals to a negative number and a bit of zero equals to a positive number, which means that our number here is not gonna be the same one as before because we're going to ignore the first position which leaves us with just seven bits here that can have possible numerical values, which also changes what the minimum and the maximum are as well. So the minimum number that we can represent is going to look something like this, with a number of one on the first position, on the sign position, because the minimum number we can expect it to be a negative one, and the end result here is not going to be minus zero, as you could probably guess, but it's going to be minus one. 28. So this is the value of minus 128, the minimum value representable on an 8-bit integer signed address space. Then what's the max going to be? Pretty easy, this one. All right, we're going to start with a zero on the first position because the maximum number we expected to be a positive one. So we set a zero in there and then fill everything with bits of one, which results in a maximum value of 127. So basically this right here is the range that we are allowed to use if we have an 8-bit signed integer, which of course brings us back to the question, what happens if we add one to this value right here, to this already maximum value? Well, this one is not difficult at all. Adding one to this number right here results in the second number here at the bottom. So normally if these numbers were unsigned, we would have something like 127 plus one equals 128, right? But with signed numbers, this extra bit right here on the first position becomes the sign of the result, which means that in this case, 127 plus one is going to end up in being minus 128. So just like with unsigned integers, adding one to the maximal value jumps that entire number to its minimum value. Now, with unsigned integers, we would go back to zero. With signed integers, we would go back to the lowest negative value. Now, which one of these situations is worst? I don't know, right? You're probably not going to want either of them to happen in your code because both of them are abnormal situations. You don't expect when you add products, when you, you add uh, logs or user accounts or anything that can be numbered, you never expect that when you add one more <laughs> to end up with less, be it zero or a negative value. So imagine a situation where you just add so many, I don't know, iPhones in your, in your basket that uh, at some point the basket starts containing uh, minus 128 iPhones. Now, what kind of price are you about to pay for minus 128 iPhones? <laughs> right? So definitely uh, integer overflows might not be so scary as buffer overflows because they don't allow us to inject code but they can definitely crash an application, bring it to an unpredictable state, and most likely create corruption in the, in the database. Don't let your code, as a mitigation method, don't let your code reach a situation like this. Always check the boundaries, check if the current values are those intended ones, and also don't forget to input validate. Because if you don't allow a user from the very beginning to provide an input that can bring you close to a potential integer overflow, well, half of the problem is probably already fixed. Now, the other half of the problem is the fact that you have to take into consideration situations where uh, due to more complex logic, the user can actually cause an integer overflow with, without providing a large value from the very beginning, probably relying on some internal calculations that your application is already doing.
All right, so for the next uh, few topics, we're going to talk about web applications. And web applications are mainly designed to accept some input from their users. And this is where most of the attacks focus as well. Because if an, uh, an application allows you to enter something in a search field, a text field, a comment, even allows you to provide the username and the password to log in, well, that's a kind of input that can be exploited by a potential attack. So let's see exactly what we can expect from attacks that target web applications. First one, easy one, directory traversal, also known as the dot dot slash attack, is an attempt from the attacker to access other files on the same machine as the web server where a normal user wouldn't be authorized to look into. So it can either target a location in the file system where an unauthorized user should not be able to access, or it could also target some other location in the file system or within the operating system actually, where not even the application itself is supposed to have access. Now in that situation, we're also facing a problem with the configuration of the web server as well. So we have an application misconfiguration. Now, if you're not properly sanitizing any input that can look like a directory traversal like this, an attacker could access other locations of the web application or even try to reach the root of the file system on the same machine. Basic mitigation against this type of attack would be, of course, to look for these dots and slashes within their uh, within the inputs that you receive from the users, either by using the application or by using a dedicated web application firewall that can look for specific attacks like these. But don't forget that these characters can also be obfuscated or hidden behind a URL encoding. Additionally, a very good way to mitigate this is to ensure from the very beginning that the application does not have any kind of permissions where it shouldn't have. So outside of the locations that are necessary for the web application to run. So let me show you how a directory traversal attack can look like. And we're going to use the BWAP application, which is an extremely buggy web application, just like they say right here. It's freely available as a virtual machine or as a Docker container, whichever method you prefer to use. And on this specific page, you can see we have a listing of a couple of PDF files here available for download. So if I click any of these, it's going to open the PDF file in a new tab. All right, let's go back to the application and let's have a closer look to the URL in the address bar. And let's open Notepad here so we can make it more visible. Okay, so this right here is the URL that we currently have in the address bar. Now you can see that the last argument here is called directory and it points to a folder apparently, which is called documents. Now let's see what happens if we replace this documents here with our own string, kind of like this. So what we're doing here is for every three characters, every dot dot slash here, we're going one level up in the file system, up to the root of the file system. Let's see what happens if we try to access this URL. Okay, so let's copy it and paste it in the address bar. And there you have it. What do we have here? Well, we have the root of the file system where the web application is running. There's the, uh, the lib, the user, the mount, media, run, proc, temp, var, all the normal files and folders that you would expect in the root of a Linux file system. You're definitely not supposed to access this area, but we can because there is no proper input sanitization implemented when parsing URLs like these. So careful with this type of attack extremely simple to conduct. So careful with this extremely simple type of attack that can be easily mitigated, but also easily overlooked. Next up, we have file inclusion. And I know that inclusion sounds really good nowadays, especially in the modern age, but it's not so good when it's, when it's about web applications and file inclusion. Now with file inclusion, we're attempting to load, to upload a file into the running process of a website. Of course, we're not talking here about a uh, normal uh, file upload functionality like you have with a, with a file sharing service or uh, a site where you can upload your resume, but we're basically tricking the application into accessing or downloading some malicious content on our behalf. And we have two types of file inclusion. First one, we have remote file inclusion, which is a way to trick the application into downloading some malicious content, usually through a script. And that content is most likely hosted somewhere online. That's why it's called remote file inclusion. An example here would be an input that is expected by a website, uh, which can also be a redirect address that's also hard-coded in the URL. Well, that address, if we replace it with some additional file online, then we can trick the application into downloading that file and perhaps even executing its contents. 
And on the other hand, we have local file inclusion, which means tricking the application into accessing a file or loading a file that's already on the same web server. Now, most of the time, this is going to happen with applications that are already vulnerable to directory traversal attacks as well, because we need the application to be able to uh, breach out of its confines and access the rest of the file system. The example here on the slide would be an application that is designed to load a specific font file from the same folder as the rest of the code. Uh, well, we can trick this application into actually reaching out to load the, uh, the shell of the operating system that the server is running on. And by the way, just in case you're wondering what's the uh, percent zero, zero at the end, that's the null character in hexadecimal. And we can use it to add it to the end of the URL in order to bypass simple rewriting mechanisms that automatically add a .php or a .html e extension to any file that we try to access. Thus giving us access to any kind of file and allowing a potential attacker to load any kind of file apart from uh, even not on PHP or non HTML files. We can uh, see a demonstration of file inclusion by using our good old damn vulnerable web application. And this specific page right here allows us to access three PHP files in the same folder. So if we click on this one, it's going to give us a, a hello message, second one, different message, third one, different message. All right. Now, if we look inside the URL one more time, we can see that the page argument actually points to a specific PHP file. Now, what if we replace this file3php with something like slash etsy slash password? And there you have it. If we don't properly sanitize that input, we can even access root level information or system level information using the same web application that everybody is using. This right here is the contents of the etsy password file on the same machine as the web application. That's definitely something you don't want to let your users access. Next up, we have the somewhat number one champion of the website vulnerabilities out there, which is called cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting attacks target a user's browser. And the purpose is to trick that user's browser into executing some arbitrary code, which is most likely going to be something like JavaScript code. And we can do this in two ways. One of them is called reflected cross-site scripting, where we trick a user into clicking or accessing a URL that already has the necessary executable script embedded into it. Secondly, we have stored cross-site scripting, where the actual script is this time stored in the database of the application that the user is accessing. Let's see them both in action. It's going to make a lot more sense if you see exactly how they work. First one, we're going to go back to our damn vulnerable web application and jump to cross-site scripting reflected on the left menu. So simple page, simple functionality. What's your name? If I provide my name in here and I click submit, it's going to tell me hello and whatever name I've just entered. Now, what if I enter something like this? So Andrew, and let me start a script in here. Something like this. Alert, hacked. Let's submit this. And there you have it, executed right away. Now, there's one more thing here worth noticing. Look at the URL at the top. You can see that the script is now embedded right within the URL. So right now, if I were to uh, send this link over email or over instant messaging to somebody else, and they were to just click on it, they would exhibit the exact same behavior. So the script now executes on whoever happens to click on a URL like this. All right, this is reflected cross-site scripting. Second one, stored cross-site scripting. Let's select it here from the left. Again, very simple page, kind of like the comments page for uh, any online shopping store that you've encountered. Let me add my name in here and then a message. Uh, this is a good product, all right? Sign a guest book, add comment, whatever. Now, this is normal functionality. Now, what if I add something like this? And instead of message, I add something like this. Surprise, and the same alert, hacked again. Let's sign the guestbook, hacked again. Now, the interesting advantage of store cross-site scripting is that my malware code, my malicious code is now stored in the database of the application itself. So I don't need to craft a specific URL and trick a user into clicking on it. I just have to make sure that a user simply visits this page at some point in time. So if I just refresh this page, for example, you're going to see that I always 
receive the same message every single time I refresh this page because the code is invisible right here within my comment. Anybody else who comes in and visits this page is going to receive the exact same code. Their browser is going to be executing the exact same code. Now there's a special category of cross-site scripting which are specifically aimed at attacking admin targets or admin accounts. So for example, we're storing some malicious code to be executed in the database only when a specific admin page is rendered in a web browser. And generally cross-site scripting attacks are very, very dangerous because they can do virtually anything. Uh, they can scan your network, they can steal credentials, they can uh, compromise your computer, they can steal confidential data, even provide remote access from the attacker to your computer. How do you mitigate this? Well, pretty obvious, right? First of all, sanitize your inputs. Don't allow your users to send you executable code. Make sure you have some defenses in place, like a web application firewall. Those are specifically designed to catch these types of attacks. Uh, secondly, we can also detect it through IDSs and IPSs, more advanced ones, of course, layer 7 IDSs. And generally, if you want to sanitize inputs against cross-site scripting, it's much better to have a whitelist approach rather than a blacklist approach, because a whitelist approach allows you to specify exactly which characters are allowed and nothing else, rather than trying to figure out which possible characters could end up into uh, some sort of hidden script or uh, URL encoded or base64 uh, encoded character set that could end up being some executable code. And don't forget that Apache and IIS and other web servers as well have dedicated modules designed to fight against cross-site scripting attacks, to detect them and block them. And don't forget, as a last resort, update the client browsers as well. Modern browsers have some intelligence built into them that allow them to detect and block cross-site scripting attacks. Then we have SQL injection, also called SQL injection. This is an attempt to directly interact with the database behind a web application. Normally, users or even application admins don't have direct access to the database behind the web application. The web application code is designed in such a way to interact with that database in a legitimate manner. But users normally shouldn't have access to run queries, to execute queries, or to even upload SQL queries as regular input. Now, of course, accessing a database can have a number of unfortunate side effects, starting from accessing confidential information, secrets, and moving on to actually corrupting the database, changing information, or even deleting the database entirely. Now, before moving on, we have to pay our dues, and because there's probably no training on this planet about SQL injection that doesn't reference this specific XKCD comic, so <laughs> just allocate a couple of seconds here. If you can understand this, uh, you're probably good to go for the Size Plus exam as well. Now, coming back here to our damn vulnerable web application, the main idea behind SQL injection is the fact that uh, an application will at some point require some input from a user. It might be a search field, it might be a username. So a website is going to expect some sort of a string, an input string, and that input string is most likely going to become part of an SQL query, some kind of select statement. In our simple vulnerable example right here, uh, just entering a valid user ID is going to provide me with the relevant information from the database uh, according to the specific ID. Now, I believe we can also have a look at the actual source code behind this page. And as you can see for this web page, the code behind the page builds a query that starts with select first name, last name from users, where user ID is the actual field that is being read from our web form. Which means that whatever I enter in this field right here is going to end up exactly as it is as part of that SQL statement that you just saw. Well, let's exploit this. What if I add instead of the user ID, this string right here and click submit. There you have it, a listing of all the usernames in the database. What happened in this string? Well, to better understand what happened, let's grab the original query from the web page code and you can see it right here. And let's also paste our customized input in here. Now, remember we said that this ID variable 
in here is going to be exactly the string that we enter in that text box, which in our case is going to be exactly this string right here at the bottom. So let's copy it and replace this ID placeholder with our exact string. Have a look at our new select statement. How does it look like now? Well, it says select first name and last name from users where the user ID is null or one equals one. Well, one equals one is always true, right? So even if user ID equals null is going to result in a false statement or one equals one is going to make this entire expression true. So basically my select statement is going to select all the first names and all the last names from the database because the where clause doesn't limit me anymore to a specific user ID. This one is always true. Now the pound symbol here, the hashtag symbol is here at the end. This is going to mark a comment. So basically I'm adding this just in case after this statement, there are, you know, more, uh, more statements, more parameters in the SQL query. I don't care about them. So whatever follows this pound symbol here is going to be considered as a comment. So my resulting string, my resulting query is going to be this one which translates into a query that lists the entire user database to me, a regular user, non-admin user, somebody who doesn't have any kind of access or direct interaction with the database behind this application. I don't even know where the database is. I don't even have a lo valid login to that database. I don't even know what kind of database it is. Now, of course, this is just a very simple example, but you can do so much with SQL injections. You can change information in the database. You can access sensitive information. You can even delete entire tables or entire databases if input is not properly sanitized. And that is the number one solution to anything related to SQL injection, actually related to any kind of injection. We're going to see in a couple of minutes that we, we have some more methods as well. But the number one method to mitigate against, against this is to sanitize your input. Don't allow your users to transmit SQL statements. Also, if you're sanitizing input, don't ever sanitize it on the client side because the client can easily be bypassed and an attacker can still send whatever they want to your web application. So always sanitize the input on the server side. Of course, you can catch attempts at SQL injection using web application firewalls or even specialized database firewalls. Another great way to fight against SQL injection is to use pre-compiled or prepared statements. Most programming languages have this capability. You just have to know about it and use it. With prepared statements, you're basically building the query first and then you add the parameters later. Now, building the query first allows the programming language to know exactly what that query is supposed to be doing. So adding additional parameters later on, even if those parameters contain illegal characters or SQL valid characters, they are not going to be processed as SQL commands anymore because the original query has been already set in place. Now, in most cases, it's not even difficult to do so. For example, in PHP, it's enough to just define some variables that hold the parameters that you're about to use in a query and then prepare the connection and the statement itself. You can see now you're not simply concatenating the first name, the last name and the email into the insert statement, but you're adding it into a prepare statement with specific unknown values. Later on, you just bind those values, those parameters to the original statement, and it's going to be executed just like you intended to. And just in case you don't believe me, you can see here that prepared statements are very useful against SQL injections. Next on the list, we have insecure objects references. And the main idea here is that, well, normally an application is going to manage access to its internal database, uh, its files, its web pages, and so on, based on the permissions of each user, or more specifically on the permissions of the user that is currently accessing that resource. Because of course we have backend objects and resources to which normal users should not have access. For example, the pricing information in a database. Let's see this one in action as well. Okay, so let's see a very simple web page that allows us to order some tickets. So you can see here how many movie tickets we want to order. That's 50 euros per ticket. How many tickets? Well, let's say four tickets. If I confirm this, it's going to tell me that I need to pay 60 euros. Pretty okay so far. All right, so what's insecure about this? Let me show you. 
Well, for this, we're going to be using the OWASP ZAP or the Z Attack Proxy, which is an interceptor proxy very similar to Burp Suite, which we've seen a couple of videos ago. And we're going to use it to intercept the request that goes out when we try to buy some tickets. So let's do this right now. Inside Zap, I'm going to set a breakpoint on all the requests and responses. So right now it's going to intercept anything that goes out or comes into my browser. Let's head over to the original website and this time let's order four tickets, just like before, and click confirm. Now we don't see the end result right away because the request has been intercepted by Zap. And apologies for the font size, but uh, Zap is a Java application and doesn't really behave well with uh, scaling on larger monitors. But in the upper area here, we can see the HTTP headers that were generated with this request and at the bottom, the content of the HTTP request. Let's uh, have a look at them in a separate window. All right, so this right here was the original request. You can see the ticket quantity for just like we selected, but notice here ticket price. So apparently the price of the ticket is part of the request. This is an example of an insecure object reference because the object of ticket price should not be exposed as part of the requests that are generated by your clients. This should be a value that is statically defined in a database. And of course, if I now have access to this ticket price, I can simply change this ticket price to whatever I want. For example, let's make it 50 cents, 0 0.5, all right? And let's grab this new content and head over back to zap and then replace it with my new content. Now all I need to do is just release this request and let it go to the web server. All right, let's head over to the website back again and you can see now that I've ordered four tickets, but the end price is now just two euros because I've just customized the price of a ticket to 50 cents a piece and I only have to pay two euros instead of 60. Right, that's an example of insecure object reference. What's the best solution to this issue? Well, sorry to say that, but educate your developers. This is not something that you're supposed to catch with a web application firewall or within any kind of firewall. This is something that you should, from the very beginning, properly design in your application. Also, never assume that your users will take a very specific sequence of steps. Don't rely on that sequence of steps to determine if a user is authenticated or not, if they should have access to a, to a resource. Whenever a user tries to access a resource, doesn't matter how they manage to get to that resource, make sure they are authenticated and authorized for that. And also try to program atomic operations or locking mechanisms so that no resource access can be executed without checking for necessary permissions first. Next up, we have XML attacks. And people generally think about XML as something really static. I mean, you can't really attack a sort of a language, right? You can't, how, how can you use it to attack something else if it's, if it's just some static text? Well, the idea here is that XML is actually used to communicate information from one application to another. In many cases, it's even used to pass authentication information or authorization information between the uh, identity provider and the authentication server. Now, of course, there are some uh, things to worry about when using XML because we're using it to send sensitive information. So sending it with no encryption or no input validation, you know, it can lead to interception of the data, spoofing of data and so on. Now, um, XML is also structured and that structure is meant for applications to be able to parse that XML code and quickly find a specific content, a specific piece of data in that payload. Now, this parsing process is the one that we're actually targeting for attacks. And a well-known attack is called the XML bomb, also called the billion laughs attack. And that's because we're encoding a bunch of LOLs in a XML file. And we're relying on the fact that XML can also encode entities and those entities can auto expand. Well, do that an infinite number of times or a huge number of times and you risk crashing or consuming the memory of the server that is processing that XML content. This right here is a sample of an XML bomb. This is the billion laughs attack. You can see that we have LOL all over the place here. And what we should be able to identify here is the fact that this XML document actually has 10 entities and each entity consists of 10 entities of the previous ones. So LOL7 is made up of 10 LOL6, each LOL2 is made up of 10 LOL1s, and so on. 
and the main document only has one single entity which is a single instance of the largest one and this one is going to expand to 1 billion copies of the first entity. And if you're thinking, oh, so XML is old and vulnerable, who uses it anymore? I'm gonna, just gonna use YAML or something more modern here. Well, with YAML, you're gonna end up with the same results, just in a different language. So you wanna see it in YAML? Here it is. <laughs> exact same code, the exact same effect, the exact same kind of exploit. And just to give you an idea just about how bad this kind of vulnerability can be, even Kubernetes was vulnerable to this type of attack until 2019. Now, of course, this is an example of a denial of service kind of attack, right? You cannot do more than crash the server using an XML bomb like this, but it might just be enough for an attacker to be able to ruin your day. How to defend against this? Well, whatever you do, don't parse the XML file beforehand because parsing it is what causes the XML bomb. Try to analyze it with a, with a simple text analyzer at least make sure that you, you're not allowing entities, for example, or that you are allowing only XML files that confirm to a specific schema. And let me give you just one more, and then we're done with this episode. That's XML external entities, or XXE. This kind of attack embeds into the XML file a request to a local resource. So even though the name says external entities, they are actually referring to local files that are accessible on the same machine as the one that is processing your XML payload. And this is made possible by the fact that, just like with the XML bomb attack that we just saw, you can define your own XML entities and point them to some local resource on the same machine. And for this example, we're going to be using another vulnerable web application, this time called Matilidae. Matilidae? Now, don't blame me if I just butchered that name. And this sample web page here is just a simple XML validator. So, if, for example, if we just provide some valid XML input, like this string here at the top, and then press validate XML, it's going to tell us that the text content parsed from XML is this one right here, hello world. Okay, let's try to inject some external entities into this XML validator. So first, let's see how XML entities work, right? I'm gonna find a small tutorial here on Port Swigger, and they're gonna tell us here that XML external entities, right, can be declared by using the system keyword, after which you must specify the URL from which the value of the entity should be loaded. So, for example, we have here two code samples. The first one is going to point the external entity to a remote location, that's an HTTP uh, website and the second one points it to a local file. All right, so let's try to adapt this to our little XML validator. All right, so our code should look kind of like this. Uh, the main message inside the XML code is going to be stored in this I want passwords variable, actual entity, which is defined two rows up as a system entity, which points to Etsy password, All right? So let's copy this entire code and let's see how it behaves in our XML validator. All right, paste it in here and validate XML. And now we can see that the actual text content parsed from the XML is no longer just a static text, but it's actually the contents of that specific injected file. Let me, let me paste it here one more time so we see exactly what we're looking for. So I want passwords is defined as an entity right here an external system entity which points to a file located as slash etsy slash password. And that's exactly the content of that specific system file. See how easy this is? <laughs> how to mitigate this, you ask? Well, first, you should validate. Secondly, you should validate. And third, you should sanitize your input some more. Okay, so I guess this should be enough for today, for this episode. Make sure you check the video description for all the links and all the tools that we've used during these demos. Let me know in the comments section if you encounter any difficulties, if you try to reproduce these on your own at home. I'll more than gladly help you out as much as I can. So thank you so much for watching and make sure you stay tuned because next time we're gonna have a third part with the rest of the attacks. Make sure you don't miss that episode either. And thank you so much for watching, like and subscribe and see you next time.